Good morning, Pastor Ed here from Hope Lutheran Church in Freehold, New Jersey, with daily devotions for November Monday, November the 1st, 2021. Uh, because we're taking a, a little departure from the narrative lectionary in order to celebrate Reformation Sunday, actually Reformation Day yesterday, and uh, then All Saints Sunday this coming week, uh, the lessons are a little bit different. We'll actually be following the lessons that are part of the Revised Common Lectionary. So this morning we'll be looking at the, the Jeremiah reading that we had in church yesterday. Uh, tomorrow we'll look at the Gospel from John 8, and then we'll also look at the Romans reading and Psalm 46. And uh, the last two days of the week, well, we'll figure I'll figure something out as we as we go along. But this morning, we're going to be looking at that Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34 reading. But before we get into that, let's begin with the service of responsive prayer number one in the Lutheran Book of Worship, uh, also known as suffragists. Let us begin. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let my mouth be full of your praise, and your glory all the day long. Every day will I bless you, and praise your name forever and ever. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness. O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He redeems my life from the grave and crowns me with mercy and loving kindness. Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come before you. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel and bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, as I said, our reading this morning uh, is one of the ones that we used yesterday in church. Um, it's from the Old Testament, from the prophet Jeremiah, uh, the 31st chapter, verses 31 to 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Doug Bratt, who wrote, has written for the Center for Excellence in Preaching, I think it is from uh, Calvin Seminary up in, uh, up in Michigan, had, an interesting, had some interesting observations uh, on this particular passage. He begins by saying that when I was in Sunday school, we sang, Into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, 
Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And as we sang, he said we imagine Jesus standing and knocking as long as it takes for us to, to faithfully open the door to and invite him into our hearts. That, however, is hardly a picture of the God in our text. After all, Jeremiah 31's God seems to be sick of knocking on people's hearts and waiting in vain for them to invite God in. Hearts are naturally so hardened toward God that no one on their own asks the Lord into them. The Jerusalem in which so many of Jeremiah 31 spiritually hard hearts live is about to fall to Babylonian invaders, he says. Its conquerors are preparing to haul off many of those concrete hearts to Babylon. David's descendants will no longer serve as Israel, Israel's kings. Jerusalem's temple will soon lie in ruins. For most of Jeremiah, the prophet basically tells, Jesus, tells Israel, rather, you had all this coming and this is why. Essentially, the prophet insists Israel deserves her fate because she has broken every covenant ever made with her, every covenant God made with her. And yet that not, that's not just Israel's problem, he reminds us. You and I confess that it's also ours. Our gods, as Martin Luther once famously pointed out, God with a little g, are whatever or whoever is most important to us. We naturally serve not the living God, but everything from our own desires to wealth. You and I also naturally love ourselves far more than we love the people around us, especially the people on society's margins and our enemies. And so when God stands knocking at the door to our hearts, begging us to let God be our God, God's people still naturally lock God out. If it were up to us, we'd never let God make himself our God and us God's children. On top of that, we'll never even naturally ask God to unlock our locked and dead-bolted hearts. However, in Jeremiah 31, the crusty old prophet of doom and gloom says, but that was then, and this is now. God's going to make a new covenant with Israel. He announces that God will write this new covenant not on tablets of stone or even pieces of paper, but on people's hearts. Jeremiah promises that a day is coming when God's people will know God's law. However, he also promises that they'll also commit themselves to obeying it by loving God above all and their neighbors as themselves. God will empower God's adopted sons and daughters to be both willing and able to obey God's commands to do justice. In fact, Jeremiah insists God's children will no longer even have to teach each other, each other about God. Everyone will already know about and serve the Lord. God bases this new covenant about which Jeremiah speaks on God's extraordinary grace. Of course, God related to Israel by grace since the very beginning. And yet the prophet Israel, the prophet's Israel, has stubbornly refused to receive that grace with her faithful obedience. And so God promises to fundamentally change her, to fully equip her to receive God's grace with her faith. The Israelites will come to recognize themselves as beloved and forgiven. Jeremiah is speaking of a day when Israel will obey God's law, not because she's supposed to, but because she wants to. She'll long to obey God's law because God has shaped her hearts and minds that way. And so Israel's capacity to be faithful and obedient will spring not from some outside constraints, but from the inside. They'll do the right thing because they want to do it. So God's greatest miracle may not be God's parting of the Red Sea or rescue of Jonah from the whale. The greatest miracle may be that God softens stony human hearts, that God equips God's children to want to do the right thing. But there are countless signs that God hasn't completely fulfilled Jeremiah's, Jeremiah 31's prophecy, however. He says they include the racial divisions that continue to plague countless countries, including the United States and Canada. And yet, once in a while, we catch a glimpse of God's new covenant at work. I think of a white woman who was a member of a historically segregated church in rural southern Virginia. A car full of drunken, joyriding black teenagers struck and killed her teenaged son. And yet she told one of my acquaintances, he says, I don't understand why I don't hate those drunken kids. The grieving mother then paused before adding, I guess God has given me a forgiving heart. All things are possible with God. He also adds, a few years ago, a band of white teenagers brutally attacked and killed 
Gene Sandiford's black son Michael in Howard Beach, Brooklyn, New York. His mom, whom people saw reading her Bible during the trial, admits that even the passage of time hasn't yet erased her pain. Sometimes I sit here and cry, Jean admits. And yet when talking about the three men who are still in prison for the murder, she says, at night I pray for them. I ask God to forgive them. And then I came across this. It's written by a, a Mark Bruner, a Lutheran, uh, apparently. And he says, one of the things that sets up the few acres, he's talking about where he lives, apart, is the artesian well that highlights our front yard. Beneath the spreading branches of the ever-present beech trees which surround it, the spring is, a free flow, is free flowing year-round. When the original owner of the property had the well drilled several decades ago, he had no idea that when the aquifer was pierced some 100 or so feet below, he would create a free-flowing artesian spring. But that's precisely what happened. Since the flow of the water could not be capped, a shallow basin was installed to catch the wellhead flow with a drain that would take the water underground uh, to a creek some 50 or so yards away. But as is so often the case with wells of this type, he writes, there's always the ever-present danger of a clog in the drain pipe, which flows underneath our house. Should that happen, the water has no place to go but overflow the basin and drain into the highway, into the driveway, I'm sorry. Over the years, we've become accustomed to these blockages, whether it's leaves or sand or the buildup of beech nut husks, something always seems to get in the pipe and, and dam up the flow. Even though it can be a bother, especially in the winter, to be confronted with water in the driveway, one thing always strikes me when I resort to plunger and hose in an effort to, to blast through the subterranean clog. The well just keeps chugging away. Despite the fact that the precious water slowly seeps away into the gravel of our driveway, there's always more where that comes from. With a little help from a plunger and hose, the creek inevitably resumes its drink while the driveway awaits for another opportunity. There's always plenty of water for the creek to greedily consume, and the spring never seems unwilling to forgive the consumption, even when it's worthlessly poured out upon the driveway. It just keeps giving, despite the taking. And so it is with forgiving, he says. I recall the story of Abraham Lincoln when he was running for president of the United States. Lincoln had many enemies, but none more virulent than Edward Stanton. Stanton went around the country calling Lincoln a fool, a buffoon, and a, a tall, lanky, ignorant man. When Lincoln was finally elected president, he did not forget about Mr. Stanton. When the time came for him to choose his cabinet, Lincoln decided that the best man for the job of Secretary of War was Edwin Stanton. With that choice, many of Lincoln's ad advisors raised a hue and a cry. They told him, Mr. Lincoln, are you a fool? Do you know what Mr. Stanton has been saying about you? Do you know what he's done and he's trying to do to you? Do you know that he has tried to defeat you at, on every hand? Do you know that, Mr. Lincoln? Did you read all those derogatory statements that he made about you? Well, after listening to their harangue, Lincoln arose and made his rather perfunct, this rather perfunctory statement. Oh, yeah, I know about it. I read about it. I've heard him myself. But after looking over the country, I find that he's the best man for the job. Stanton accepted the nomination and soon became a very good Secretary of War. Although throughout the early years of that service, their friendship was never more than cordial. He gradually learned to appreciate, even admire, the president. And when Lincoln was assassinated in the spring of 1865, Stanton was deeply grieved. The man who had once hated Lincoln more than, more than any man had learned through Lincoln's grace and kindness what true friendship was all about. And at the president's funeral, Stanton delivered a very different kind of oratory than that which he had become so famous for but five years prior. After a moving and salutary address, he made the now famous statement, now he belongs to the ages. Because of Lincoln's free-flowing and never-ending end, willingness to forgive and forget, he had turned a bitter enemy into a devoted friend. Lincoln understood the concept of what might be called artesian forgiveness. No matter how much you pour out, you must never expect it to return to you. You just need to be a free-flowing source of precious life-giving forgiveness. 
if you stop to examine where that forgiveness is going, or find yourself focusing on how often that forgiveness is not returned, but is simply soaked away without recompense, you might as well be a mud puddle whose worth is spent when the sun has dried its substance and turned it into the hardened patch of common dirt. Martin Luther wrote, A Christian should have a well which cannot be dried up or exhausted, even if his charity is poured out like water into sand. Christians like you and I must never be compared to mud puddles, he says. We need to love without condition and forgive without the hope that what we give will be given back in full measure. We must never grow weary of doing good, for our Savior has never grown weary of us. As many times as I've preached on Reformation Sunday, 36 times now, I guess, and have seen that Jeremiah reading, it never struck me quite as much as it has this time about the God forgiving and forgetting. Of course, I focused that, uh, focused on that in my sermon yesterday, to forgive and to forget. Um, God models that for us. God spoke of that through the prophet Jeremiah. God lived that out uh, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's the model for us as well, um, to forgive as we have been forgiven, to forget as all the things that we've done throughout our lives have been forgotten by God. Well, let's close this morning with Luther's morning prayer. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you've protected us through the night from all danger and harm. We ask you to preserve and keep us this day also from all sin and evil that in all our thoughts, words, and deeds we may serve and please you. Into your hands we commend our bodies and souls and all that is ours, that your holy angels have charge of us, that the wicked one have no power over us. Amen. The Lord Almighty order our days and our deeds in his peace. Amen. Well, as always, I hope your week gets off to a good start, and looking forward to to being back together with you again tomorrow on Tuesday. Until then, take care. Bye.